Okay, there we go. Uh, my name is uh, Leslie Conwell. I'm on the staff of the Historical Association and I'm the operations manager. I'm the program director and I'm the Feast of the Hunter's Moon event manager. And most people that know me know that my real love in terms of local history is Fort Wiatnon. So I'm thrilled to be able to, to do this program tonight because I'm sharing with you some things that are, are just really special uh, I think to our county's history and certainly figure into the overall French Canadian history of the United States. We ought none was quite the place. Um, we're gonna have a couple of um, guests here that are going to be providing some expertise. Um, first is my husband, Rick Conwell. He knows more about the artifacts. He cataloged them when they came back from Michigan State University. They had been kept up there for study for quite a bit. so. He is extremely well versed with what's in there. Um, I'm going to pick on David Hovde to do some of the ceramics if we have a question on that come up. And then I'm very happy to welcome Ward Oles from New York, who has very, hi Ward, has very kindly agreed to uh, come and lend his expertise. Um, if any of you are on Facebook, the Feast of the Hunter's Moons group page has had what's called a school of the artifact. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And that's how I got to know Ward and he's been very helpful. It is warm in here. Our air conditioner has a little bit of trouble keeping up here. So I apologize about that. Um, welcome to our show and tell program. That's a special program where we invite our membership and our guests to bring in things that they would like to share that are interesting in regards to local history. We'll do that first, and then we'll launch into the We Ought Not Artifacts. So you brought something today, didn't you? Okay. I had contacted Leslie about this earlier, and it's been so busy this summer, I haven't been able to get back to you, and I apologize for that. But this is the place that I found in the state fail about what we ought not. You got it? <laughs> And there's a story on the back about it. It's a really short story, but I was just curious about, you know, the um, origin of it. And you, you gave me the basics, mm -hmm. uh, but I haven't had an opportunity to pursue it any further. So, and also in the back of it, it says number one. Is that like just one of first of a series? Or is this just a prototype? What do you think that number one is? On there because um, no, I, I think you got the number one place. Really? I <laughs> think it's like it's printed like sort of really yeah. okay. Do so you yeah. think it is like the number, number one? one? I think it's the, the first okay. one. Okay, yeah. Well, we got well there was never another one then. No, <laughs> that I can tell you. So, it's like a prototype type thing the very, very Well, first one. those were done in the early 70s. Right. As some of you know, I've worked for TCHA since like the mid 70s, yes, I'm that old. And uh, those plates were produced uh, to kind of promote the feast, uh, you, you know, the dig and that sort of thing in the association. But what they did, they bought so many of them that as late as the mid 90s, we still had them in boxes. So did you sell them at the, at the block house or when? No, they were, most of them were pitched. Really? Your, yours, yeah. The canoe treasures of the day. Yeah, similar. They were commemorative. And there was never a second one issued. Yeah. They sold okay. There was a silver spoon. Mm -hmm. Collecting spoons was really in during that time period. Okay. And there was one. Yeah, people I haven't had any luck yet. So. Yeah. yeah, so. So you mean that's just like the actual number one or just the first variation? When I look at it, He's correct. It, it is stamped. I think they initially meant it as one of a series, mm -hmm. but whoever ordered them ordered enough that we could give them out to feast participants and visitors for the next like four years. I think there were that many. Wow. Yeah. Seriously. Thank you. I thought that's kind of exciting what we saw. Well, but actually, they don't turn up very often. I have, have you seen any of them? No. And as many as were produced and sold, I'm not sure why that is. So it is something we don't see anymore. 
Yeah, it brought me back to my childhood. So. Well, I apologize. Yeah. I haven't had to get back to you. We've been so busy this summer. I haven't been able to follow up with you. Oh, so. that's, that's great. I'm glad you brought it. Thank you. Do we have any of the collections? Oh, yeah. Collections would have them. And the little spoons. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is not local, but um, from Arizona and Utah, whenever I went to an Indian reservation, I would buy something. So this one is Navajo. Yeah. It's very creepy. It has a lot. Huh? It has a lot. I guess. Cool. Okay. And the other one is interesting in that um, this one, let's see, I had it. This comes from. Um, San Juan Reservation. The tribe is S.J. Paiuti. And um, the, interested, the thing that interested me was this is a drinking cup. They lined the inside so that it could be used <coughs> fluid in it and drink it. Uh, Leslie? Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that uh, Michael Galbin um, actually jumped in here because he's a Washoe Paiute from Nevada. And I think he would be very interested in that uh, vessel. Okay, great. We'll go ahead then and get that. If, if we're recording now, so we can bring that to his attention. Okay. okay. Yep. Very cool. Well, and that's part of the fun of show and tell is we get to, to learn and, and um, as Pete says, we hope with show and tell, everybody goes home having learned something new. Anybody else have any show and tell items for tonight? Anybody on Zoom have a show and tell that they wanted to do? Okay. All right, well, um, we spent some time today um, underneath our feet are uh, some of our collections. We have collections stored primarily in the basement here at the History Center and then also at the Argon Bright Genealogy Center and Library. The Fort Wyatnon artifacts are here. Um, but most of them came back, uh, I believe that was in 2000 from Michigan State University. Uh, the dig, the, the way they found the fort, we won't go into this too much today because we don't have the time. Locals like my grandfather, Earl Honeywell, kind of knew where it was from surface collecting just seeing things there. Um, he gave, he found a brass, what's called a C bracelet, just a very simple brass bracelet that he found from that area. And local collectors kind of had an idea. Uh, but in 1967, a farmer just about eight tenths of a mile down from Fort Wyatnon, what we know is the original site now, had just plowed his field. Uh, one of the gentlemen that went up in that airplane, they had infrared photography, but as I understand it, you could see it with the naked eye. Uh, looked down, took photos, and we know that Fort Wyatna was burned to the ground in 1791. And that leaves quite an ash bed, even this many years later. And the farmer was plowing and turning up some of that ash bed, as I'm sure he had done for year after year after year. So it really was kind of remarkable that they just happened to be doing an aerial survey at about that time. So um, we do have that picture and it's, it's really a neat thing. Um, Indiana University excavated for the first two years, Dr. James Keller. For a couple of years after that, a um, couple of students at Purdue and amateurs excavated, but you know, they were very wise. For the most part, they kept themselves to the surface to surface little surveys because they knew they did not have the expertise to do a full-fledged um, archeological excavation where they're opening up the earth. Michigan State University was called in because they at that time and still are, uh, were experts on 18th century French colonial archeology. span I was a Purdue student in the anthropology department during that time and Purdue anthropology always got slammed for not being the ones to do the dig. Well, but that's not what they did. You know, they were more into Mesoamerican stuff at that time. So it was a really good fit between Michigan State University 
with their professionals and students and the Tippecanoe County Historical Association. It's been estimated that about 15% of the original site has been excavated. 15%. So if you could see what is under my feet right now, it's phenomenal what we have in the basement about what has been excavated. Um, they found some of the features that, that is an archeology span term for a significant, like a building or, or something like that. Uh, they found two wells. Well, back then, a lot of times people just check their trash down the well. Bingo. Um, we found several things, including a subterranean storehouse, what they think was a trader's storehouse that had caught on fire, the roof had collapsed and burned and preserved all those artifacts, you know, the trade goods that were in there. So you're gonna notice some of our artifacts are remarkably well preserved. Many of those came from that storehouse that burned and the roof collapsed. Michigan State University also had the knowledge and expertise to take care of these items and professionally conserve them. And so uh, you'll notice again that they have done just a tremendous job. In terms of archeology span now, there'd been quite a pause before much had been done. A lot of that um, organizations kind of go through changing interests, you know, in terms of priorities and everything. And I think we ought none was always a priority. It's just getting someone to do that excavation because these are not inexpensive was one issue, uh, Mike Rostrzewski uh, came and did some excavations in uh, 2014 and he found the Waffle House. Uh, archaeologists sometimes use terms, you know, you'll hear us refer to the Austin Powers sleeve button and the Texas Rangers sleeve button, you know, we give nicknames to things. And it was a particular type of um, dwelling that they uncovered that they felt looked like a waffle house. So uh, there was some, an excavation, a small one to be done with students from Straczewski's classes and from here at Purdue with Dr. Uh, Corey Cooper that were supposed to be done in 2020. Well, we all know what happened to 2020 and also in 2021 in the summer, and we all know what's happened now. So we're looking for that to take place. Um, next summer, and we're excited about what that might find. Um, some of the goals that we have um, is to not do any harm. You know that uh, phrase, do no harm if you're a doctor or whatever. We know that years from now, archaeological techniques might be easier on the land or the artifacts are less, in, less invasive. So that's one reason we're proceeding cautiously. Uh, but just also little bits at a time is what the plan is. It's now a National Historic Landmark, the Wiat Non Preserve, which has formed, it's over 200 acres, I believe, Pete, isn't it? That has been formed around the original site of the, the fort. So I think you're going to be seeing a lot more about Wiat Non's history. We're very excited about it. But what I wanted to do tonight was I like show and tell. Yes, sir. In the meantime, where the preserve now is, uh -huh. um, without excavations and activity, it will tend to just be overgrown. What stuff is it being farmed? No, it's um, the. That's a very good question. That's outstanding. the The original site of the fort is currently safe. It is hayed, which means that there's no. That's just surface. There's no tilling really of any sort. Plus when they backfilled the dig from the last time they were there in 79, then it's been covered and it's protected. There's also a layer of plastic, I believe, that shows where, so if for some reason somebody was digging and they hit plastic, well, you know, attention. So it's very protected. Right now, um, Colby Bartlett is the director of the Wiatnam Preserve, and they are putting in prairie. They are restoring the prairie. There's a lot of remarkable partnerships going on here. 
So with the Archaeological Conservancy that we ought not preserve, um, which by the way is a separate organization than the Tippecanoe County Historical Association. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. I mean, so this is all kind of coming together in these partnerships to save Fort Wyatnam's history. And it's for somebody who's seen it so long and hoped for this kind of thing, it's really very gratifying that, that the importance of this site is being understood. Um, does anybody have any questions before I start showing off the groovy stuff? Yes. Yeah. There is another preserve association or something. What do you call it? The preserve operates it. Okay. Yeah. We own the land. The Archaeological Conservancy is involved too. And then the Wiatnan Preserve administers that part. Yeah. We're all we're partners, if you will, that it takes to to get a project like that off the ground. Good question. Yes, basically. Um, they, yes, we have meetings. We have the We Ought Not Preserve Committee that meets with people from both. So, yeah. So, um, I like show and tell just as much as anybody else. And I guess there's a few things that I wanna point out about these things. My fourth grade teacher was very wrong. <laughs> the impression, and even up to pretty modern students, I hear this, is that everybody here during that time period, 1717, it was the first European settlement in the state, to 1791 when it was burned, wore like feed sacks, was barefoot, primitive, you know, I mean, the dregs of society. And once you see some of these artifacts, that idea will go poof out of your head. Um, these people brought their beloved things with them. They brought their beautiful things. Uh, we're discovering, and, and I think Ward, you know very well, he's been along with us for the ride as we've been going through all these artifacts. There's a lot of manufacturing going on at We Ought Not. People are doing stuff, you know, making things, they're repurposing, and that's all reflected in the um, archaeological stuff. Now, I'm going to put on my uh, museum lady gloves here. What I'm going to do first, for those of you in the audience, uh, Zoom land, I'm going to take the camera here, and those of you behind me will be able to see um, what we tried to do was get some representative artifacts, things from every day, all the way up to show-stopping jaw droppers like these copper pieces here, some of the silver jewelry. And we'll talk about some of these, um, some of the uh, trade silver jewelry, the brass iconographic rings, paste stone jewelry. Ward's gonna talk a little bit about that. Everyday eating utensils, a shovel, glass bottle, um, ceramics, both very plain and very nice, are here knife blades that are traded, tomahawks, axes, shot molds, ladles. So we tried to get you a good representative sample here. The first thing I'm going to start out with is something that is really, really popular with what we call the School of the Artifacts. I mentioned it briefly earlier. But on the Feast group page, when COVID first started and we were all home and all just devastated by job loss and everything else in March of 2020, um, I thought, hey, I've got time. I'm going to take pictures of the We Out Non Artifacts and I'm going to post it online. And I had two goals. I wanted people to learn because these artifacts, we don't get these out all the time. You know, We wanted people to see what we had. With the Feast of the Hunter's Moon, people come to see people interpret life, reenactors and living historians for, uh, interpret life in the 18th century. Well, if we don't show them what we found at Fort Wyatnon, 
how can we expect them to really up their game for interpretation? Same thing, our craftspeople who do 18th century reproductions like David Hovde, Ward, you know, people like this, they want to do the right thing. They want to make the right things for sale, but if they can go on the internet and see some things, but if we haven't posted our things, how are they going to know? And I think there's been some real surprises here. The first box I'm going to bring around um, are the most popular of everything we post. And Ward, I'm going to lean on you a little bit here. Sure. Can you speak briefly about paste glass stone jewelry and what we are looking at here um, for the Zoom group before I sure. walk this around? So uh, let's see, uh, where do we have? Okay, so any of the rings that you're seeing in there that have glass stones in them, they're often referred to as paste glass. And the paste is actually a, a vitreous paste enamel that's melted down and made into these really, um, you know, beautiful stones. A lot of them are molded. Um, some of them are cut stones, but they're just made to emulate uh, glass or sorry, um, precious stones. Um, but then there are also some there like the ones to the left of those iconographic rings um, that have like molded glass uh, gems that have floral patterns in them um, in the top left corner of your screen there. Okay, we just got a note that somebody couldn't see the rings. Is that yeah, correct? It, yep, it was just showing the uh, the heart and the platform there. There's okay. yep. Now we're okay. Now we're looking at four uh, seven stone. Well, two seven stone and uh, nope. We got a five, a seven, and looks like two threes. Uh, there's a single. There's ones with stones in the bands, but these were extremely popular. Um, you know, throughout uh, colonial uh, native North America. Okay. Um, word, one question we get all the time sure. from School of the Artifact participants, and by the way, any of you can join the thesis group and become a School of the Artifact student, is they say, these must have been very valuable. What are your thoughts about that word? Um, they're actually, uh, a facsimile of something very valuable. They were typically a brass with glass stones. So it was kind of for people to wear them as if they were wealthy. Um, but again, they were, these were specifically brought here um, for the most part to trade with native peoples just because they liked the, the sparkle of the rings, they liked the flash um, and it gave, you know, some, uh, some sort of, of image of wealth, even though that in itself was kind of not a, a native uh, cultural norm. Um, that was something that was pretty much brought with the rings to show that, hey, I have this stuff or I have something nice. Um, but they also, work. sure, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. David Hovde said they were kind of the cubic zirconia. Of yes, day, right? that was, yep, that's right. They, they were the, the, the Walmart CZs in, you know, uh, you know, really cheap settings. And Ward, can you talk a little bit about the iconographic rings that we are showing you? These are the brass rings, and I'll come right. back and show them on Zoom. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I've looked at them enough that you, you can just show them around um, or maybe put them on the screen for the people online to see. Um, but uh, those are a ring that formerly people called them Jesuit rings. Um, and it was found that they were not all, uh, had not all of them had religious significance. Um, so that was kind of a blanket term, um, a misnomer if you will, but um, <clears throat> they're all, um, let me see what we've got there. Some, so there was a style drift in these rings. Some of them, you know, started out, and I don't know if there's any in the Wiatnon collection that have the cast embossed um, like images of saints or anything like that, but seeing as no. this is like post 1717, the likelihood of that is pretty slim. Um, so the earlier rings, the ones that actually had true uh, religious origins, um, 
eventually evolved into the rings that you see here. So some of the initials that are on them, I don't know if you can get back. So yeah, so yeah. That's, a, that's a great one there. Um, that particular ring is, uh, it looks like two superimposed M's, but it's an AM and it's the Ave Maria. And it's the, um, that is a carryover from the earlier um, iconographic, or sorry, the Jesuit style rings. Um, some of the others like that with the RI, um it could be an ri it could be an rj um you know the the initials start to like throw curveballs when it comes to interpretation okay thank you so much for that but i wanted to start out with those because again that's what people like the best um some everyday items here and i'm going to scan them for the zoom audience and then we'll carry them around uh, there's a couple pieces in here. Um, let's see, I'm going to put this on camera and you should be able to see it. These are musket balls, probably that have been made into dice. So, you know, boredom was probably uh, something that happened at the post quite a bit. And then I'm going to do a quick scan here. There's more of the paste glass. Can you talk a little bit, Ward, about sleeve buttons? Um, sure. Uh, as far as the sleeve buttons go, we're, I think we're off the sleeve buttons. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right. So, yeah, so sleeve buttons are another one of those things, super common. Um, and it, okay. they, weren't, they weren't, yep, we got them. We weren't limited to, uh, plain when it came to sleeve buttons it it was anybody's game they had the paste glass like you see here silver gold brass pewter um i think the only ones i haven't ever seen was iron uh those are of particular interest too um yeah. because they're def definitively french um would you say they were saint hubert saint hubert St. Hubert, which is the patron saint of hunters and metal workers and mathematicians and a bunch of other stuff. So, and rabid dogs. And rabid dogs. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and walk these around. Um, Larita, if you don't mind doing the the vocal part, uh, we've got some more paste stone jewelry. Nowadays, we would call sleeve buttons cufflinks. And this is something that I mean, women wore these um men um this is something that in my opinion in living history reenacting we need to do a much so better job right on here. yes huh? with the paste glass oh, you're fine those are alls we've got what is called trade silver um rick do you want to you and ward want to talk a little bit about trade silver that we ought not you want to get up and speak to mic, please <laughs> Trade silver was one of the most common trade items all over the eastern part of North America in the 18th century. Probably only probably only surpassed by the by the paystone rings. Uh, the most common common pieces were probably the little round ring brooches. They were made largely by European educated silversmiths working in Canada and imported in huge quantities for the native trade. And in the in the little tray there, she's got everything from little cross pendants to heart brooches to ring brooches and uh, oh the, fish I think the, the fish hooks <laughs> yeah those are those are not trades no, they hooks. are they are pretty big sizable fish hooks though but the nose wheel is what I was trying to here, let's, come up with camera on the nose wheel here. yep so um or ear wheel I'm, Yep, that is the middle of an ear wheel. I've got one here, Leslie, um, okay. that I can share my screen. Give me just a second. 
Yeah, I enabled screen sharing. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Share screen. Can you see that? No. Uh, how about now? How, can you see okay. that? Now? Yeah. So that's what we're looking at there in the middle. That one piece that's cut out, it's all of this right here in the middle of that. So that's just a, a cut apart uh, ear wheel that was repurposed into something else. In your opinion, did men and women wear these or just men? Uh, as far as the earrings go, um, there are period images that show both men and women wearing them, but it seems to be the predominance um, was that men were wearing ear wheels, um, often multiples, you know. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, while we're on the subject, why don't we go look at some of the big pieces? Okay, now we've got a special treat for you guys all tonight. Um, we, we truly have some spectacular pieces, so much so that the art, of, uh, we loaned them to the Idol Jord 20 years ago, and they've had them on exhibit 20 years. They just came home. Uh, so this is their debut here. And um, first thing we're gonna show is what's called a gorget. Um, Rick, do you wanna explain what a gorget was? Yeah. Round gorget or a moon. A, a real gorget is crescent shaped. It's a holdover from the throat protector on suits of armor. By the 18th century, they were trade items or military or had hung on in the military as an insignia of rank. There were also these round, called, a lot of times referred to as moons. This one has a crown engraved in the center and the mark of Robert Cruikshank as the maker, who was a Scottish expatriate silversmith who worked in Montreal. These two holes would have been for the suspension cord to be, to be hung around the wearer's neck, usually with a little, a little silver boss button on each end. I don't know if you can see the crown very well. I'm going to go ahead and show this to our in studio audience. You see the crown? Yes. Yes. So they've had, it just came back. This is yeah, from the idol to her. Yeah. And that, that particular artifact, along with some crosses, is very important for the Tippecanoe County Historical Association because the discovery of those inspired people to create yes. what the earlier um, uh, form of the Tippecanoe County Historical Association which had a different name, but the same people that founded that founded the Tippecanoe County Historical Association later on. What was the earlier organization? It was like the Historical Society of Tippecanoe County or some similar name like that. Yeah, yeah. But that that artifact, along with a couple of crosses, inspired uh, Weatherall and other community leaders to found a historical association. And they actually say that. They, it's, you know, it's not a story. It's, 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 documented. It, it's documented that those were the artifacts that created the organization. <laughs> Gretchen's found touch marks. <laughs> Gretchen's been my best friend for years. Can you tell? <laughs> and and it also it should be noted that that artifact was not found on the Fort Wyatnon site. It was it was found near where the block across basically across the road from where the block house is today in the park. Yeah, just across the road. Yeah. So within sight pretty much. Yep. So, okay, the next thing, and we're gonna probably have to keep moving pretty quickly here, but if you can give me both crosses. This is, these are silver. Um, <laughs> when I check, I check in with Ward a lot about our stuff. Um, he's quite an expert on material 18th century co culture. 
and I'll always say, so are these like as cool as I think they are? <laughs> he's always honest with me as to what they, if they are or not. He's popped my bubble a time or two. But, not you know. intentionally. <laughs> yeah, but, he's, but that's what I like. He'll tell me the truth, you know. Um, there's the designs. Now the double bar cross. Um, Rick, do you want to talk about the significance of double bar or or whoever? They're both silver snakes. It's they're called the cross Lorraine. And even after all these years, I'm still a little bit ambiguous on the details, but um, they were they're the, the symbol of the Lorraine region in France and were very popular as a trade item in the French areas and particularly as specifically in the Jesuit areas. I've never been quite clear on what the significance of the, the cross what might have been originally to the Jesuits, but those and the brass iconographic rings generally only turn up within about a 500 mile radius of Michelin Mackinac. It just, you know, you go, you, go to, you go to the French sites in Alabama and Southern Louisiana and they go, well, oh, those are nice, but we don't have them down here because uh, the, there was a, a different order of priests who were missionaries to the Indians down there. The Dominicans or, or Benedictines, I can never remember. Um, but up here, it was the Jesuits. And wherever the Jesuits were, we tend to have double bar crosses and these little brass iconographic rings like this. Now, in School of the Artifact, we have the sharp pointy category. So, uh, Rick, you want to talk about these or what that you think is they are? The pommel knob and knuckle bow from a small sword. And then there's also this piece of blade that we don't know that these are all from the same sword, but they're all from the same type of sword. I always try to display them more or less together. So we don't have any of the rest of the hill. Rick, is that one that's the, it's flat on the back? Is it three-sided? Blade has diamond, diamond shaped and cross section. Okay. What does that mean to you? Um, well, it, the uh, the three sided ones are a Kalishamard blade, um, and they're typically very French. Um, and I was just uh, wondering if that was, you know, if it was actually a diamond or if it was the kind of like a almost like a very long bayonet blade is what a, that Kalishamard is. Oh, okay, yeah, this one is symmetrical on on both sides. It has okay. a little median rib going down. Going yeah. down each side. So yeah, it could be either French or English. Or sorry, yeah, French yeah. or English. Yeah, the pommel pieces always look always look British to me. Yeah. Like they look just like mine at home. Okay, speaking of sharp pointy things, in School of the Artifact, we get um, asked a lot about knives. We have boxes of knives and boxes of knives. They're so um, Rick, do you want to walk around the or show that to the Zoom audience first? You want to do the case knife or the folders? Uh, this oh, one. this one. Yes. Yeah. This, this is one that has not fared too well over the years of being handled since I first saw the thing. But it's a very neat little, probably a, probably a gentleman's folding knife with a bone handle. Folding knife. Probably. Yeah. Um, and that would date from the first um, half of the 1700s. Probably Rick, century. Rick, that that one is definitely pre seventeen sixty, pre exit of the French regime. It's a it's a um, CMY, a, a Siamese knife, 
uh, French origin. It may be that it's been um, rehandled, but I doubt it um, because typically they're boxwood. And you've got three other, four other blades over there on the table that match, or three at least that match that profile, the CMWA profile. Here. Um, I'll bring them. these up for the yep. Zoom audience. Yep. Those are those are all well. One's a Dauphine and the other one's a CMWA. So the one on yeah, the this left is there, the Dauphine. That's a Dauphine, and that's the one on the right is the CMWA. So if you were to hold that up to the one that Rick has, you'd see that the profile is the same. Okay. Great. So we do know that knives were a very important item on the frontier. And since I'm on a roll with sharp, pointy things, hey, Rick, where's the brass one? Hey, Les Leslie? Yeah. We should definitely add that um, knives were import items. They, they weren't something that was being made on the frontier. So okay, they were great information. So, okay. Here's a uh, tomahawk. Yeah, it's a round pole, this, round pole hatchet. Is or does that have a, a flat on the back or a spot for a bowl? Nope. So okay, so it's a, a round pole hatchet or axe. Round pole hatchet or axe. That's pretty good shape, wouldn't you say? Yeah, almost usable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And we get that question in School of the Artifact. Man, you know, have you tried using that? It's like, no, I get fired. <laughs> Could you get that one there? The, the, yeah, okay, the thank you. Um, Rick, what about the brass with the floral vine? Could you get that one out? So Ward was talking about the two different kinds of blades and he said two different things. What did I don't understand what that meant? Was that like makers or the styles? And those are different styles. So there's several different styles of French folder um, in the that period of material culture. So you had uh, well you you can break folders down into two categories. You can break them down into spring back and friction folders. So the spring back have a, obviously a spring um, in them that holds the blade open. A friction folder relies on the compression of the rivet um, at the pivot point to keep the blade fixed. Eventually they wear out and they flop around and you know stab you while you're reaching in your pocket and that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> ask me how I know. Um, yeah, but um, what do we got there? Uh, shot mold. Oh, okay. What caliber do you think this is? I would, I would say that that was <clears throat> um, probably uh, buckshot or swan shot. Okay, that's how it's been identified. This is to mold lead shot. See, they pour the hot lead in there. Do you see how there's like a little neck on there? They file that neck off. Those are pretty tiny. Yeah. It's swan shot. Bird shot. <laughs> Yeah, basically. Yeah. So, so yeah. bird, like that type of bird shot was what bird shot was. Um, you, later on, you get drop shot um, or tower shot, but um, you know it's it's not as consistent as it might be today for those of you that are familiar with uh, fowling or small game hunting. Speaking of um, birds, uh, we have a. Speaking of birds, we have a huge faunal um, as assemblage, bones, animal bones. And uh, I was just kind of be bopping through those. And there were passenger pigeon bones. And I can't tell you what that's like to look, you know, and handle an extinct animal like that. And uh, the archaeologist that did the faunal remains for Wiatnan in the 70s is on the feast group page. Every morning at about 5 30, he's on there. He's still working. He, he's, he enjoys it so much and he's there to answer questions. Um, real quick, I'm going to bop back into the sharp, pointy things. Um, if you want to explain what that is. That is a very early iron trigger guard from a French fouling piece. And You've got you. You have a hold of it, kind of right at the most diagnostic part, that sort of diagnostic or the diamond-shaped 
bow, which I'm told dates it very early, possibly before 1700. Oh. That's that's kind of the star of our iron gun parts. And you refer to this as a trigger guard? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a technical term. Yeah. yeah, you'll get it. You'll get that next semester. <laughs> Gretchen just asked me a real good thing. I don't think the Zoom viewers could hear me. I was walking around going, "Oh, this is like in the major groovy gun stuff," you know. And she said, "Well, what do you consider non-groovy?" You nothing. No, for me, it's like if somebody wants to see something in the lead or lead scrap drawer, I get a hernia practically. That lead is so heavy, or the iron scrap. So I always try to avoid those drawers. The slag is only groovy to me. And the slag, yeah, that that's just not not too fun. Um, now on the ceramics. There is a snoop bowl of ceramics that have been unearthed at Weatnam. I'm just going to pick something pretty utilitarian and something a little fancier. Um, the blue and white is Westerwold, is the classification for that. I'm going to ask David or Ward to identify this one here. That's all, David. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Hunt says Ward. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It just, and the GR is George Rex. That's the same. Yeah. So, so Westerwold, oh, what is that word? What does that refer to? David? He says, what is, what does so Westerwold? That, uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, that, that's a uh, German uh, salt glaze pottery. Uh, yep, and I, as I recall, uh, I, I haven't looked at it for a long time, but the most complete of those is actually the British king that was before 1717. I don't remember who that is. Is that like George II or who it was, but it's not. Uh, so th there is there is a, a number of pieces at Fort Wyatton on that actually you know, uh, predate uh, uh, predate uh, the founding of Fort Vietnam. Some coins and and some some of the pottery might be um, there. Some of the pieces are small enough that it's really hard to tell, but uh, they could easily be uh, a couple of pieces I looked at could easily be uh, have been manufactured in the 1690s. We've got something really neat here. This is something that kind of sat on a box on the floor that I walked by countless times. Rick did, everybody else. Put off the model it, yeah, put off the model A. <laughs> Until um, Larry Young, um, a specialist from Fort Michelmackinac, came and, and just did one of those, you know, Bugs Bunny where they stop in their tracks and back up with their eyes going out. He says, What? <laughs> Look at that. This has fleur de lis stamped on it. This is King's French King issued shovel, British military shovel. This is why it's so critical to work with others on your archaeology. I didn't see this. Rick didn't see it. Numerous other people didn't. Um, we have pictures where it shows better, um, but there's three distinct Fleur de Lis on here. And again, Larry knew what to look for. That's why. You know, I have a little hand lens in my pocket if anybody wants to really try and yeah. zoom in. <laughs> so, <laughs> be a French but this, this helps make my point is that, um, like for School of the Art, in fact, I don't know what I would have done without Ward's help, um, without Rick's, without David's. Colby has been helpful, um, Tom Wojcicki, all these people putting our heads together so that we can. The Fleurly is, um, yeah, that's it. That's one. But yeah, we're like, if the shovel, they look, you know. So where are there? there's one here. There's one mm -hmm. right there. Mm. 
But in this case, Larry Young knew what to look for. You know, yeah. And so it is absolutely vital that we share these artifacts so that we can all learn from each other. Boy, that sounds like kumbaya. <laughs> um, glass, tons of glass. I was told there was no glass on the frontier. You gave me bottom of the case bottle. These were put in cases. You know, lots of glass. Here. There was a, there was a great deal of brandy that was uh, sent to Fort Vietnam, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, out there in the wilderness, you got to make your own entertainment. There was one shipment that uh, by every, all the, every vessel carried uh, brandy casks. And I was trying to remember what is the term that is the measurement for uh, a pot but by the gallon. Yeah, pot. Yeah. 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 Pot. yeah. It's like 1.63 gallons or something like that. This artifact here is one of my favorites because we have a picture of it being excavated out of the ground. It's like a latch and it's in really good shape. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And the, again, the neat thing is we have a photo of when they excavated it. That's survival. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah. They found it in the subterranean storehouse. So, um, and, and the other thing about the Wiatnan artifacts that I hope you take home is what we're looking at here, and it's like any other collections TPHA has. These aren't just objects, they're stories. They tell us a lot about the people that live at Wiatnan. And we know from these artifacts that they had a hard life um, at times, but they also brought their beautiful things with them. For instance, this is something that just totally blew me away. <laughs> Who would have thought they had, um, now this is, I don't have a piece of a jeweled shoe buckle. Uh, this is, this is, looks like a pendant. But we have jeweled shoe buckles. We have multiple jeweled shoe buckles. Now, when you were in fourth grade, would you have ever thought they had jeweled shoe buckles? And where we are not? An import thing again? Yeah. Well, Look at the, the beautiful. The, that is an example of you know our misconception of of, of how uh, the French on the frontier dress. Yeah. We always think of, you know, there's moccasins yeah, yeah, and buckskins and all that sort of stuff. There, I, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I remember reading a dissertation a few years ago uh, where they looked at the clothing of, of various French sites, you know, the, the documentation, everything else. And basically the people of Canada uh, dressed like the people in Paris. And there's, you know, and they're not wearing, you know, uh, buckskins and, and moccasins, et cetera, et cetera. They're wearing what they would have worn if they lived in France. Absolutely. Um, whether it was uh, Paris or Montreal, I mean, Paris really set the um, the the bar for the fashion world, um, and everybody else tried to keep up. But that wasn't even that wasn't limited to just cities. There were a lot of people out on the frontier who were still trying to find some semblance of normalcy in their environment and the thing that they could control was what they wore so they were wearing you know um all the the stuff that anybody else in the cities would have worn and the other thing that i and again um i'm no expert in this but i've i've been told that like if you look at painting there can be extremely wealthy people wearing just plain brass buckles Sure. And, and people of a lower class wearing the jeweled ones. There, there's several um, narratives written about house servants wearing nicer things than the ladies of the house because they were trying to vie for the attention of the uh, man of the house and mm -hmm. getting in what trouble. A scandal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Through Walmart and Monticello today. <laughs> okay. Um, this, these caused a big stir when I first started posting these. In living history, the big legend for years was that they didn't have four-time torques. 
And that was it. I mean, like, if you had a four times short, you got busted, you know, because we didn't have those. Well, that we ought not. We have two, three, and four times, but we have far more four times for than anything else. But again, we can't fault these people that are making assumptions necessarily because if the information is not given to them and they don't know. Um, and that's not just about we ought not, that's with all of our collections in general. If we don't share, we show and tell and other things, people do not know all the time. So, so a little more about the fork there, Leslie. Yeah. Um, Fortress Louisburg has four time forks. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Uh, so does Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Niagara. Um, so does Mitchell Mackinac. They look like they came out of the same set. That was the French thing in the British too. Mm -hmm. And the full time fork would just represent the latest. No, not necessarily. What, 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 what's the significance of it? Of the four time fork? No, yeah. it was no more significant than a two time or a three time. They weren't a specialized thing, but they were definitively French. Okay. Um, oh, French. Yeah. Well, what I'm passing around now is a quizzical piece. Um, it's made of, I think, Kaelin clay, a type of clay. clay. Um, the uh, archaeologists laid it, labeled this as a child's toy or a chess piece. piece. Um, I think potentially a wall plaque, maybe part of a, a, a child's toy too. Um, we have more pieces of this and it has a horse head with the mouth, inside of the mouth, you can still see the red paint, which is really, really cool. Okay, um, I know we need to kind of wrap things up here. Um, we have vials of beads that when you get up, we'll, we'll show you those. Um, let's see. Oh, Ward. Yes. How can I forget the copper? Yeah. Okay. This is a beautiful, stunning piece that's been at the um, Idol Jorg. Um, I'm going to say, take it away, Ward. Okay. Talk about it. So cooking vessels of the period can be broken down into a couple of very basic ones. This would be considered a pot. The top of the pot is smaller than the base, whereas a kettle would be the opposite. Um, these are scaled down from, that's as a, I would call that a personal uh, cooking vessel, but they typically had a lid that doubled as a frying pan. Um, and if I can find the image, which is probably they, on, are they trade items or something? That they, they are. They they were something that was in common usage. Yep, Rick's got the uh, one of the lids that would double fit that pot. That would fit that pot. No, it doesn't fit that pot. No, yeah, yeah. That one's about but, six, six and a third inches. You get the idea. Yeah. Which one is uh, David? It's the, the one that Rick's holding. Six and a third. Yeah. So, okay. So, what about the uh, the pot there, the size on that one while I'm trying to dig up this other? All right, I can figure that out. Here. Was it normal for everything? To always be that small? Or was that just because? No, that's just, that's just a very scaled down version. So, a lot of the stuff that was being produced in the 18th century, whether in France or England, was done more by scale than it was by measurement. So everything was uh, done the by top of the smaller ones about three and a half inches across. About three and a half across. Mm -hmm. That is tiny. Okay. Um, let's see here. And you showed the lid. Yes. Okay. Um, let me just take a quick tour here because it's right at, at seven and. Um, I think, can you show the your box with the brooches? Uh, where we're going to bring out the ring brooches with the bobs. Okay, while you're doing that, I'll see if I could find that other image of the uh, pot. Put them on here. Okay. Rick, is, these are um, kind of fragile, so he's going to take them and put them on some cotton. We talked about trade silver earlier, but this is a little set, and there's, there's more than these four, I didn't get them all out. 
of a little ball and cone, what were what were called ear bobs. Yeah, up, made to be worn as earrings. <laughs> these are these are all attached to little ring brooches. And it was a common it was common to fasten the ring brooches on an article of clothing like a head head scarf or something like that and wear the wear the two pieces together. Well, Leslie take them around, but it's always been a bit enigmatic to me because that to me looks like something you that would be found in a grave. You know, uh, you know being worn by in a burial by the person. But there really were no, I don't believe that we know of any real native graves that we ought not. So I'm a little, I'm a little, I've always been a little intrigued by this little set of ring brooches and ear bobs because they look, they, they look like they belong to a garment somewhere. It's, you're making me wonder. I've not heard anybody mention. Um, are there any of the stuff that we're talking about or been found related to burial sites in the fort area okay, or there, the settlement area? There was a burial of a uh, found in the late 19th century, I believe, in the vicinity of Wiatnon that I believe was identified as perhaps a native. I think I saw one reference to possibly a civil war soldier, you know, but we ought not know we have, um, I'll be frank, there was one square that they were excavating like they do and they uncovered um, several burials. They appeared to be European because there were nails found like in the outline of the coffin. Um, two of the burials were taken to Michigan State University for study. Um, one, if you do an old search of journal and courier records, uh, made quite the headlines. He was a murder victim. That was very clear. Um, had three or four tomahawk cuts in the back of his skull and a knife cut going up on his ribs. He was also buried with a key. There was a key balanced on his pelvic bone. And there was in the Vietnam documents was a reference to a murder. So is this that we, you know, so it's a bit intriguing. Leslie, what it is. Yeah. Uh, Leslie I don't know if you yeah. recall that uh, narrative that I found uh -huh. where there, there was a guy that um, uh, a French individual that was accused of killing um, a Piancasha man and uh, his relatives came to uh, basically stir things up and they gave the guy to uh, the Piancasha. So it's possible that that guy that was killed was in relation to some sort of blood feud that actually happened at the site. That's, he's correct. There, there's something called a Wiatnan War. Yeah, believe it or not, there was. And it just involved a struggle between young men, both. French and, and maybe so. With the Wiatnan site, which is large, I guess, is it typical um, of other French forts of that era that in terms of the presence of burial or the absence of burial sites? I think as far as Wiatnan goes, once they realized they might have hit the post cemetery, they didn't have any interest in okay. further exploration at that time. So um, there would have been, a, you know, at most of these French sites, I would assume there would be a, you know, especially if there's priest present, there's going to be a chapel okay. and, and with the chapel comes a uh, cemetery. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. And in the area of, of Fort Vietnam, over the, over the, you know, since the, late 19th century that they have encountered burials when they're putting in roads or house sites and so digging basements. Uh, and some of them have clothing and they've, uh, and again, 
some people dismiss the early descriptions, but some of, you know, like Purdue professors from that time period examined those skeletons. And, you know, they have uh, French military uniform parts, or one was described as could, was wearing priest robes. So, you know, uh, from the, some of the descriptions I've read, those, those people knew what they were looking at. So, and, and, but uh, later people have dismissed uh, them as, you know, they didn't know what they're talking about because that was then and this is now. But I I don't dismiss them, because, you know. Yeah, there's there's, yeah, pretty, you there's yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So were most of the burials inside the fort proper, or were they outside? Like you know, nowadays they put cemeteries way far away from populations. So I didn't no, know these were they're inside. That's what they did primarily back yeah. then. Or did you have a comment? Yeah, um, it depends on depends on the site, really. If there's an interment within the fort, it might have been done during a siege in the middle of the summer, something mm -hmm. like that, where you know they were dealing with decomposition of bodies and they would just dig one hole and put everybody in it. Um, whereas if it was a, a planned out deliberate thing, um, usually um, cemeteries would end up outside. So and then you've got the whole like cemetery versus graveyard. Was there a chapel there making it a graveyard or was it a, a cemetery proper, you know, where people were actually being buried in that 64 years of occupation? Pretty likely there was something on the outside. And like Leslie said, you know, unless there's a, a significant interest in, you know, going through those remains, which there really shouldn't be, um, you know, they're, they're out there somewhere just uh you know where they're where they you know un, where they're undisturbed and that's not really an interest to pursue yeah. a, a lot of the a lot of the burials that have been found uh outside of the fort area have been on the secondary terrace you know where the where the south river road is now so uh and that's where they've encountered some of them it's during road construction during, like yeah that. so they're that above the Typical flood line above One the probably outside the water supply too. Yeah, exactly. One interesting thing that we're looking at now: um, there was a couple skeletons from 18th century. They think found along the riverbank, DNR type of thing, but one of them appears to have been African American. So we're trying to see what sort of connections we have there now. Kind of to wrap up before we let everybody get up and take a look. This is one of um, the Vietnam artifacts that very early uh, in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s was reproduced. There's a fleur de lis on that spoon. What do you mean? This is the original spoon that oh, was found. Mm -hmm. But the Vietnam dig, the lady by the name of Barbara Strode, now Daryl Sheldon, has reproduced this spoon. Can you see the fleur de lis on it? Yeah. I've got one right here, Leslie. Oh, do you? Of uh, the reproductions, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if, if I can get close enough and you can see. Yep. There you go. Yeah. You find out a garage sale? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you show up. So uh, before we roam to look at artifacts, does anybody from the Zoom audience have any questions or anything? Please They'll speak. have to go and turn on their microphones, Leslie. I see yeah. a series of, so. Looks like everybody has their mics off. Hey, Ward, I've got a question. Sure. Um, the, the pocket or the, you know, the folding knives. Yeah. That, you know, and I not even pretend to claim that I have any knowledge of them, but there are some that have kind of almost like a spoon-like shape at the end of them rather than a point. Yes. Can you tell me about those? I can. So those would be fall into like the St. Cloud category of knife. Um, there was a point where the King of France passed an edict that knives at the dinner table could not have points on them, and it was supposed to prevent an assassination. Um, <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, so that, you know, so you see a few of those still floating around in the 18th century, uh, end up looking like a butter knife. 
um, mm -hmm. but they're still, they're very sharp. They're just a, a blunted table knife, essentially. Um, okay. So those would be a folding table knife. We have some of those, I think, in our yeah, collection. Yeah, I think you do. I think you do have a couple. Yeah. Yep. We do. Good question. Anybody else from Zoom? If you have one, you need to unmute your microphone. Anybody here? I have a question, Leslie. Sure. Uh, Jan Dixon. Um, yeah, hi. Now, distinguishing everything you've shown us today was from the typically the early 1700s as compared to throughout the 1700s or uh, any time through the 1700s? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it was early. Some of it was like really early. And then there's, we've actually, Ward and Rick, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've got artifacts from the whole span, heaviest to my knowledge during the French occupation, which was up to 1761 because that's when the bulk of the population was. Um, there were several thousand people in the area at that time, um, which is a very dense population if you really think about it. Um, so yeah, it, it runs the whole gamut. It's pretty we much- We also it. have things that were from the 1800s that were found in the process or, or not? Yeah, because, and that's primarily in the, what's called the plow zone because when you're doing archeology, span or like before they identified it as the real site, you're plowing and farming and you're turning over the soil. So think about that you are doing, it, it's like a mixer. So in other words, um, one archeologist I know keeps a pop top can lid in his exhibit display because it was found beneath French colonial artifacts. <laughs> well, that's because of the, um, the yeah. And then the name of the Facebook group, it is um, the Feast of the Hunter's Moon group, official group, that I have posted over 1,300 artifact photos there. So it's a very active group. Um, Ward is, uh, he has a company called At the Eastern Door. Um, he's been a highly valuable partner, as you can tell, and he's become a dear friend along the way. Um, Ward, can you speak a little bit about what you do? Uh, so basically I research and reproduce um, 18th century material culture. Uh, I started out um, with a, uh, kind of a, a personal interest in native material culture, but then that when I started seeing the, you know, a lot of the cultural crossover, a lot of the trade goods, um, I went down every single rabbit hole I could find. Um, and that ended up being a uh, you know more English focused at first, and then I started seeing a a real void um, in what was available for French material culture. So that's when I went down that uh, that rabbit hole. And Leslie and Rick have been instrumental in understanding um, a lot of what's out there, and. Uh, you know, and having some phenomenal examples in the collection to study and um, kind of contribute to my knowledge base. It's a partnership. One thing I didn't have anything out of, children's things. We have numerous ch child's things in the collection, especially toys, games, that sort of thing. So we do have a record of children at Weatnon and, and um, just some really, really great things. And as you can tell, you know, I have a very cool job <laughs> that I get to learn from things um, and get to do show and tell. Um, any last questions before we take a look, EC, at the artifacts for the people that are here? And then for our Zoom audience, I'm gonna take another sweep with the camera. So Gretchen, can you stand behind this far table, Rick, here? Um, and then Gretchen, put some gloves on, please. She knows the museum lady thing. And then um, you can go ahead and come on up. I'm gonna cruise here for our Zoom audience. And by the way, if you have any other questions or anything, um, my name's Leslie Martin Conwell. You can email me, um, director at tippecanoehistory.org. 
um, or you can join the feast group page. Can you guys see on Zoom a good idea of some of these beautiful buttons here? That we've got. There's the sword blade, another pewter spoon. Taking another look at the paste. And these are, again, just a very, very small amount of the artifacts. Check out the thimbles. Or do you want to explain why the one thimble has a hole in it? So the one thimble with the hole in it is uh, something that was done to create a cone, a bell. Um, sometimes they were stuffed with hair. Some, sometimes they were hung as a uh, uh, an ornament. Um, let me just pull something up really quick here. Uh, thimbles is one of the most popular things I post. When I post thimbles, man, people love it. Hang on, I got something here for the, the group, Leslie. Okay, Ward's gonna bring up so thimbles. This is uh, in Cambridge. This is a, a, a bag that is uh, constructed of dew claws um, from the, the shins of a deer. Um, and it is completely covered in thimbles as it uh, as we show here. So give me a second. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, so I'll go through the images, but now you can see like in actuality how those things are suspended. Yeah. So many times things that had a, a pur intended purpose by the European was morphed into something entirely different by the native peoples. And to me, the, the thimbles is a classic example. <laughs> um, we've got a, thank you, Ward. You're welcome. Cool. Okay, we've got a door latch or like a trunk latch here, gun lock, more buckles, and then gotta take a look at the paste curving in it. Jewelry. Uh, this particular blue setting has carving in it. Or is that cast? Or that, that's, that's a molded. Molded. Okay. Is there a better light? Yeah, let me see if I can get a better light. There. Yeah, that's that looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, and we have beads. We have, it's not an exaggeration. <laughs> we have tens of thousands of beads. That, that is a definite rabbit hole you can go down. So, um, all right. Any last questions from the Zoom audience? Hey, Rick. Yeah. That, uh, that iron trigger guard, do you think does, I mean, I'm not sure how far you've gone with looking at that. Um, is that predate the type C? I would have to get back to you on that. I, I, I've always kind of thought of it as a type C. It's got the, um, it's got the potted plant anterior finial. Right. And I ran on to some similar ones in the, in the Tunica Treasure. A yeah. While ago. Which, by the way, is my favorite book of all time. Yeah, <laughs> and it also is that the, the, the site is pretty close to in date lives as, as Fort Wyatton. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but that. Of course, the, art, the, the material came from a different direction. Would it not have gone up the Mississippi River? It would have, it would have, yeah, it would have, it, it, well, it probably came from. Uh, um, down actually, oh, really? uh, unless it traveled overland. Um, yeah. But uh, I remember when the like uh, uh, the sites around Mobile. What are the dates for those? Uh, those are it's like 1730s to the end of the French regime, so 1763, I believe. Fort Toulouse. Okay. Okay. Um, Ward, if you don't mind hanging on in case there's any questions. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm right here. We're going to go ahead and let 
Um, everybody go ahead and get up if you want a closer look. And for those that brought show and tell, if anybody wants to come up and see what they brought, or did you pass that around earlier? Yeah. You did. Okay, so let's go ahead and come on up and take a look. If you guys have that book is what got me started in doing French colonial pottery. Oh, the Tunica treasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I was an archaeologist for for uh, three years down in Louisiana, and uh, so I got a chance to look at uh, you know various collections in New Orleans in particular. Um, and of course, the Tunica treasure is now on display in the Tunica Museum, the Tribal Museum. Where's the, where's the microphone? Right. 